using across the fence. I'm Will Michael. Aquatic scientists say our devastating floods and ongoing rain will mean more pollution and bacteria flowing into Lake Champlain. The UVM Sea Grant Institute notes that more water trans translates into more things being washed downstream, and that includes phosphorus and bacteria that cause beach closures and the toxic blue-green algae blooms. To protect human health, scientists have a specific process for testing and monitoring our swim beach waters. Here's more in this video from Sea Grant. Monitoring water quality at beaches is important to help ensure the safety of swimmers. Lake water is sampled regularly to check for presence of harmful bacteria or other pathogens that may be present in the water as a result of things such as faulty septic systems, manure spills, geese or duck overabundance, swim accidents, or malfunctioning wastewater treatment plants. It's not practical to monitor for every kind of harmful bacteria or pathogen that might be found in beach water, so instead, we use what are called indicator organisms, which are easy to collect and test for. And they still give us a glimpse into if a beach has been polluted by fecal matter. The most common kind of indicator organisms used in fresh waters are called Escherichia coliform, otherwise known as E. coli. E. coli live in our guts and help digest the foods we eat, supplying us with necessary nutrients and sending what isn't necessary off as waste. Therefore, if E. coli are present in the water in high concentrations, there is likely a source of fecal contamination in the water. Luckily, most strains of E. coli are not harmful to us. Instead, they are necessary inhabitants of our guts and the guts of all warm-blooded animals. They serve as indicators of fecal pollution because the more there are of them in a water sample, the more likely it is that harmful bacteria or pathogens are present. Collecting a water sample to assess a water body for bacterial contamination is a straightforward process. Gather the required supplies, including waders, gloves, sampling bottle or bag, marker, and a cooler with ice before heading to the monitoring location. Once you're at your site, if you'll be sampling from the water, put on waders, disinfect your hands, put on latex or nitrile gloves, and then label your sample bottle and the cap or your Whirlpack bag with the site location, date, and time. Move slowly into the water to about knee deep. Allow the water to settle from having been stirred up by your movement. Open the sterilized sampling bottle, taking care not to touch the inside of the cap or the bottle. Reach out towards deeper water from where you are standing and turn the bottle upside down so the opening faces the water. Plunge the bottle into the water. Immerse it to about elbow's depth and move it in a sweeping motion away from this part it. To complete the collection, turn the bottle upright at the end of the sweeping motion and bring it up out of the water swiftly. Pour off a little of the water so the bottle is filled only to the shoulder. This allows for the sample to be gently mixed. Gently place the cap on the bottle and rinse. Pour the sample out behind you, away from the sampling location. Repeat this process so that you rinse the sample bottle and cap three times. The fourth time you fill the bottle, again, pour off a little of the sample so the bottle is filled only to the shoulder, and then firmly cap the sample. This is your collected sample. Immediately place your sample in a cooler on ice, and if you're delivering it to a lab, be sure that you get it there within six hours of when the sample was collected. Complete your data sheet with all required information. It is critical to include date, time, location, and the name of the person sampling on the form. It is also important to note field conditions such as weather the previous two days, current weather, and site conditions. It is a good idea to use pencil to complete your data sheets as that will hold even if the paper gets wet. If possible, Print your data sheet on right in the rain paper. Finally, protect your data sheet from your sample by sealing it in a Ziploc bag. Now that your sample is collected and your data sheet is completed, deliver or ship them to the lab where your sample will be processed. Your results will be available 18 to 24 hours after the lab has processed your sample. A result of 235 or greater CFUs, or colony forming units per 100 milliliters, represents an exceedance of the state standard for freshwater in both Vermont and New York. 
CFU is a measure of the number of bacteria colonies that grow when the sample is cultured in the lab. This cutoff point represents that about eight out of 1,000 people will show signs of illness if swimming or immersed in water that exceeds this limit. A challenge with the available testing procedures is that results are not available until the next day. As such, we only know tomorrow if the beach was safe today. A general guideline is this. If there has been a rainstorm within the past two days, there is greater likelihood that water will have higher bacteria levels. You can also check websites for the state or municipal beach to track past beach closings. As many will use a longer term average of sample results, generally determined over a 30 day period. Lake Champlain is a natural treasure. We all have a part to play in protecting it and the waters that drain to it, now and into the future. This video was produced by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, a partnership among the University of Vermont, SUNY Plattsburgh, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. To learn more about Lake Champlain Sea Grant and to see other videos in this series, please visit our website. While aquatic scientists are busy on the lake, maple syrup producers are staying busy in the off season. This is the time of year to check and replace lines, to repair or upgrade the sugar house. It's also a time to learn about maple grading. It is the sugar maker who's responsible for accurately grading the maple they make. To learn how to do it properly, Keith Silva takes us to the Maple Grading School. As summer greens give way to autumn golds, sugar makers gather at the Proctor Maple Research Center to learn how maple syrup makes the grade. Oh, dear God. Or not. It's easy to know what bad tastes like. It's hard to explain why, yeah. During the summer and fall, the International Maple Syrup Institute, a nonprofit organization representing all facets of the maple industry, funds maple grading schools across North America. Grade A pure maple syrup must fit within the standards for color, clarity, density, and flavor. The grader then determines which grade the syrup receives. Golden, which has a delicate taste, amber, a rich taste, dark, a robust taste, and very dark, which has a strong taste. The school teaches how to discern differences in these criteria and classifications. Also as important is how to tell when the taste is off. We all have different sensitivities. Like Mark Isselhart is UVM Extension's maple specialist. Have you tasted bad syrup before? Sure, yeah, it happens all the time. Uh, I've even made some bad syrup, so uh, it, it does happen, and that's okay. You know, the, 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 the thing not to do is ignore it. The, the thing is to identify that there's an issue and try to figure out what has gone wrong. Sometimes it can be really hard to figure out. I know it's not right, but I just don't know why. That's, that's you know, part, of, part of what we do is to try to help answer that question. Environmental factors and production practices impact the grade of maple syrup. Ultimately, it's the responsibility of the maple producer to ensure off-flavor syrup never reaches the consumer. Now, I don't have a very good palate, you know. I either like it or I don't. That's about as far as my palate goes. Dale and Melanie Miller drove eight hours from north central Pennsylvania to attend the grading school. They run a 7,000 tap operation on 550 acres. For Dale, this school is about gaining an advantage. I'm always looking for an edge. I mean, uh, I come from an area that's very highly competitive. There's probably six or eight producers in our area. We enter all the contests and we do all that stuff, you know, and trying, trying to do that. Uh, and so, you know, I'm looking for that edge that I can have, that I can, you know, detect the flavors or maybe yeah, it's, it's all good. It's interesting to taste the different flavors and maybe detect what caused them. Maybe it's something that you can change uh, to do that. Obviously, some of the stuff that happens naturally, um, you know, the buddy syrup and different things, uh, is not something you can do anything about it except maybe quit. Tucker Diego works in the Consumer Protection and Food Safety Division at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Part of his job is investigating concerns from consumers and sugar makers when something doesn't taste quite right. The unique thing about maple is that grading involves the flavor component. 
So there's no way to test the flavor. Um, you have to taste it. So part of my work, and this is, the, this is where the training comes in, is being able to develop my skills at um, picking out those flavors, those off flavors, um, so that I can um, you know, more accurately grade those products when I'm out doing a retail store inspection. For Diego, detecting the subtleties of maple syrup means developing a taste for it. A lot of the times you know immediately there's something wrong uh, with this sample, but knowing how to describe what you're tasting is hard. Uh, there's kind of a whole language that goes um, with it, and so that's why tasting as a group is really helpful. You know, it doesn't always hit you immediately. It can kind of linger on your tongue uh, or on the roof of your mouth, and that's something that, you know, this, uh, this training is really helpful to practice that. So there's a lot of things that we need to know how to pick up. Um, but at the end of the day, it's fairly straightforward to tell that this, there's something wrong in the sample. Grading maple syrup is the last stop in a long process. And if it's done well, the results are all the sweeter for the sugar maker. There's too much work involved in making pure maple syrup. Everything from carefully growing and, and, and making sure you have a healthy forest to the hard work of installing, tubing, tapping, all of that before you even get into the sugar house. Once you get into the sugar house, there's all the work of making of this luxury food product. It's, it would be um, a, a, a real shame to lose value by just not identifying when they're off flavors or having some part of the process be, be done incorrectly. For these sugar makers and maple industry pros, scoring a spot at the maple grading school guarantees many sweet returns. In Underhill, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. The UVM Extension Maple program provides research-based information to producers and anyone interested in making pure Vermont maple. For more information, go to the website uvm.edu slash extension slash agriculture slash maple. That's our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence. Mm -hmm.